Welcome to the Unit 5 Test Remediation Pack Practice, or excuse me, the Guided Practice. Uh, we're going to start off by reviewing the idea of electron dot diagrams. And so the first thing it says is what types of electron dot diagrams are illustrated. And you actually have a couple of different choices. And the two choices you have are number one, valence electrons. And number two, you have shielding electrons that are sometimes called inner electrons. So whenever you have a valence electrons, remember valence electrons are the ones that are involved in bonding, and bonding is what we're looking at when we talk about electron dot diagrams. So remember the bonding only occurs with the outside electrons, which we call the valence electrons. Okay. Next it wants me to draw an electron dot diagram for a couple of atoms. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to walk you through potassium. Remember potassium is the element K, and you always start with the element K. Remember, it only refers to valence electrons, and so then you locate potassium on the periodic table. Since you find potassium in group 1, you can now say, okay, since it's in group 1, it's going to have one valence electron. So you draw one valence electron, and that one valence electron, that's the electron dot diagram for it. Okay, next for silicone, remember silicone is in group 14, and so the one thing that I want to caution you about is remember, whenever you're doing silicone, the first thing that you have to do is you have to we have to have four valence electrons. The first two valence electrons go together. Remember those represent the s orbital. So you put those first two together and then you distribute the other two and when you do you should get something that looks something along the lines of that. And finally for argon you should have something that looks like this. With a total of eight valence electrons. Okay, what elements will have identical electron dot diagrams? And that is anything that is in the same, excuse me, the same group or the same column. All of those things will have the same valence electron structure with very few exceptions. For example, uh, argon has the same valence electron structure as neon. But you'd have to be careful because it's not the same as helium because helium only has two valence electrons available. So for the most part, as long as something is in the same group, it's going to have the same electron dot diagram. Okay, next it says, what determines if an atom will gain or lose electrons? And that has to do with the term electronegativity. Now remember, we're talking within a bond. So some atoms like to gain electrons in a bond, and some electrons like to lose them. So whatever, whenever you're looking at um, whether it'll gain or lose electrons, you're looking at the electronegativity. Now you'll be provided with a periodic table of electronegativities, and the more electronegative something is, like fluorine has an electronegativity of 4.0, the more electronegative it is, the more that it wants to gain electrons. It's going to pull those electrons away. Now, if you were to compare that to something like we talked about earlier, which was potassium, potassium has an, an electronegativity of 0 0.8. And so if you look, it's much, much smaller, and it does not want electrons nearly as much as fluorine does. So now what is the relationship between effective nuclear charge and stability? Um, the greater the effective nuclear charge, the tighter it's going to hold on to those electrons, the more stable it's going to be. So for example, neon, argon, xenon, all of those noble gases have the highest effective nuclear charge. If you were to add another electron row, the effective nuclear charge goes to zero but as is, they have the highest possible effective nuclear charge. Okay, next, it wants you to name these ions below, and this is something that you should be familiar with. This is a polyatomic ion, so it's a polyatomic ion, it's going to be a chlor-8. There's nothing you can do other than memorize those. For example, this one right here, you should know, is carbonate, and there's really nothing you can do other than memorize it. And then finally you have, this is just an element by itself, and when you have an element by itself, we just call it its name, and in this case, it is barium. Next, it says, write the formulas for the following. Once again, this is just another thing that you have to memorize. Perchlorate is ClO4 minus, and sulfite is SO3 2 minus. Just memorization at this point. So how does the strength of ionic bonds compare to other types of bonds? Uh, we consider ionic bonds are strongest because they create positive and negative charges full positive and negative charges ionic bonds are the strongest so how does that what does that mean for melting point lattice energy those sort of things well whenever you look at melting point 
I have something that's like NaCl. NaCl. In order to melt something, you have to separate these things from being a solid structure into being two separate, um, two separate compounds, two sodium chlorides. Because of the positive and negative charges between them, you're going to have a really strong attraction. So in order to separate those two things, it's going to require a lot of energy in order for you to separate them. So because of that, the melting point of ionic compounds is very, very high. Okay, you can say the same thing about the lattice energy. The lattice energy is the energy required to separate the ions. It is once again very, very high based on the fact that you have positive charges and negative charges and those things attract one another. Next, you have write the chemical formula for the compounds below. This is another thing that you just have to memorize the ions as you go. Okay, so the first thing you would do is you'd say, okay, I have barium and barium has a charge of plus two. And then I have sulfide, which is just the element sulfur, because anytime you see ide, it's that element by itself. And sulfur is going to have a charge of minus 2, because it's in group 16. So then I have to ask myself, do these charges balance out? In this case, they do. So I rewrite it as BAS. Okay. Next one, I would go to ammonium sulfate. And remember, ammonium sulfate, ammonium is NH4, and it has a charge of plus, which means plus 1. And then you have sulfate, which is a charge of 2 minus. So you should notice that those charges don't balance. And if you balance them correctly, you should end up with something like NH4, in parentheses, 2 SO4. And finally, if you know how to do iron chlorate, remember once again when you have Roman numerals what that means. And so you would say iron ClO3 3. Now I want to do the reverse. If given the chemical formula, I want to be able to name the compound. And so remember the first time, the element you just kind of name. So in this case, whenever I name number 11, I just write it as sodium. Okay, and then I write bromide. Remember, anytime you have a second element that is an element by itself, like bromine is, then you would just write it as an ide. Okay, next I would write barium because that's the first element that I have right there. And then I would write what this polyatomic ion is, and that polyatomic ion is cyanide. Remember, I don't have to do any dyes or anything like that, dyes, tries, anything to balance out to represent this 2. You don't have to do anything with that, because that 2 is there solely to balance the charge. And then finally, I would have to write copper. You should recognize copper as a transition metal. And then you would have to specify the oxidation state of copper, which is 2. The only reason why I would know that is because sulfite has a charge of minus 2 and the charges have to balance. So that means copper has to be a plus 2 in order for this to work. Okay, next we would go down and we say, okay, we need to calculate percent composition. And the first one it says is to find the percent composition by mass of carbon in each of the following. Remember, anytime you do percent, percent is just part over whole times 100. And in this case, I'm looking for the percent mass of carbon. So whenever I do this, I look at the whole mass of this thing, and I would go to the periodic table, just like we've done for molar mass before, and I would say that the entire mass of this thing is 16. The reason for that is I have one carbon, which has a mass of 12, and I have four hydrogens, all of which have a mass of 1. So when I add those up, I get 16, and then I would take the mass of carbon, and I would divide it by the mass of the total, and when I do that, I end up getting something like 3 quarters, or 75%, whenever you put it into percent composition. Okay, next I will tell you that for carbon dioxide, it's the same process. You have to ask yourself and say, okay, what do I have here? And you have 12 grams from carbon. You have 2 times 16 grams for oxygen. And then when you take those things and you add them up, you end up getting 12 plus 32 is 44. So to find the percent by mass, you would get 12 divided by 44 times 100, and then you would solve. And when you solve, you would get 12 divided by 44 times 100 is approximately 27.3%.
Finally, you would do the same thing for this molecule, and you should be able to recognize that that molecule is glucose. And when you do, you get something along the lines of um, a total of about 45.6% if you do it correctly. Okay, next it says determine the number of moles, excuse me, determine the number of the number, not moles, of ions. So I'm looking for the number of ions that are present. So the first thing that I would do is I would recognize that this thing right here is lithium cyanide, which means it has a positive ion and a negative ion called a cation and an anion. Since I recognize those, I can say, okay, if I have five moles of lithium cyanide, for every one mole of lithium cyanide, I get two moles of ions. Okay, That would get me to moles of ions, but it says number, not moles. So it's very exclusively telling me one mole is 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. So now what I would do is I would enter in my calculator 5 times 2 times 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd, and I would get a final answer of 6.022 times 10 to the 24th. Okay, in this last question, you should recognize that you have 25 grams of lithium carbonate. And whenever you take a look at the formula for lithium carbonate, you realize that you've got to do an extra step here. So the extra step is you have to go from grams to moles. And then once you have moles, realize for every one mole of lithium carbonate, you have three moles of ions. The reason for that is you have an Li+. Plus an Li plus and a CO3 2 minus for a total of three ions. Once you did this, you would say one mole of ions gives you 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. So the trick to this question is recognizing that you had to go from grams to moles, and this is like 73.8 is one mole, and then going from moles to moles of ions and then moles of ions to actual number of ions which is your 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. Now you should continue to do your independent practice. Use this as a guide to help you complete all the questions. If you still have any questions make sure that you talk to your teacher before moving forward.